Okay, and uh, that was Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan, so much for a fascinating episode. And uh, now we're going to turn to uh, this episode's animal highlights. So welcome back to the show, Hannah. Hello, thanks for having me back. Uh, so what are, we, what are we talking about this time? We're going to be talking about bark beetles. Bark beetles. Bark, bark beetles. And I'm guessing bark beetles are somehow related to trees or they bark like dogs. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> that would be a pretty cool animal highlight. There are these beetles that bark like dogs. <laughs> no. is, this, is this an onomatopoeia? Are you really leaning into the sound theme? Like, yeah, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> Unfortunately not. They are beetles <laughs> that you may find in bark. On a okay. Beetle. All right. So I'm um, going to hand it over to you to uh, <laughs> teach us about bark beetles. Okay, so one of the things that you and Jonathan talked about today um, was about insect sound recordings. So Jonathan played those amazing ant sounds. And so I would be remiss <laughs> if I did not use this time to talk about David Dunn's famous recording series, The Sound of Light in Trees. Um, so these are, anyone who knows, who, who is interested in, in animals and sound have probably heard about these. Um, so in these recordings, he used innovative recording techniques to sonically capture the interior of a pinion tree. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Which had been taken over by bark beetles after periods of drought in New Mexico. So we don't often think about the sounds that small insects might make, not the least what the soundscape of, a, of the inside of a tree might sound like. Um, so indeed, in most cases, without recording devices, we would likely never know what these species or places sound like. So they're not audible to the human ear. You wouldn't be able to pick them up with a conventional microphone. Um, so these recordings are, are kind of an example of how acoustic methods or sonic methods um, can give us access to animals' life worlds um, that are radically different from our own. So with these recordings, Dunn's intention was to, quote, convince the listener of the surprising complexity of sound that occurs within one species of tree as emblematic of the interior sound worlds of trees in general. It also intended to demonstrate the rich acoustical behavior of a single species of small insect and to suggest how sound is a much more important aspect of how it, the insect, organizes the world and interacts with its surrounding ecosystem than previously suspected. So these recordings were taken to trace a major outbreak of a Mexican invader species of bark beetle um, that can kill trees that have been made vulnerable to infestation um, through drought and climate shifts. So the recordings, I'll talk a bit about how the recordings were made because it's fascinating, but they were made with a custom built vibration transducer, which was inserted between the outer bark of a tree and the interior um, of a tree. Um, and so I'm no sound recording expert, but I believe that sound trans, that vibration transducers are um, pretty similar kind of bigger versions of the contact microphones that Jonathan talked about in this interview. Um, so they pick up sound vibration, sound as vibrations on solid surfaces. If you tried to use a conventional microphone to record these sounds, you would likely pick up very little. The kinds of sounds that are made by bark beetles are unfortunately not barks, <laughs> um, but are better described as chirpy, like chirps. Uh, chirpy chirps, uh, which are made through an organ which is called a pars striden that functions as a friction-based grating surface. Um, so that's how the noise are made. Um, and you should definitely check the sounds out on David Dunn's website. He has a bunch of examples of it and they're pretty crazy. Um, so Dunn says that over the course of a tree's infestation, the interior of the soundscape of the tree, the interior soundscape of the tree changes. So in a sense, the recording may be very useful to measure the health of a tree, but perhaps more interesting is that Dunn has this hypothesis about whether the conditions that make a tree vulnerable to infestation in the first place, so those drought and climate conditions I talked about earlier, um, whether the beetles might actually be able to hear those, those vulnerabilities, and that might be how they know which trees to attack and which, are, which would be available for infestation. So I'm going to quote him here to make sure I get this right. Um, but he says that as the tree's vascular system becomes stressed from insufficient fluid transport, 
discontinuity, discontinuities in the integrity of its vascular conduits cause small partial vacuum bubbles to form. These can implode with such tremendous instantaneous force that under laboratory conditions, they have been measured to produce temperatures up to 5,000 degrees centigrade. When these cavitation events occur, they release both light and ultrasound signals. Under extreme conditions, some trees produce these events at an almost continuous ultrasound signature, end quote. So the hypothesis being that the beetles are able to hear that ultrasonic signature, which leads them towards the trees that they're able to infest. So that's, you know, pretty cool. <laughs> um, so here, what I kind of wanted to highlight is that we have a kind of twofold and multi-species account of sonic methods. So first, um, we have how the beetles may use sonic methods to locate species of tree that they can invade. But the second sonic method being how human sound recording recordists can use innovative recording techniques to make these sounds audible to humans. Mm. So regarding the latter, um, I think that being able to hear these creatures um, might help us to evoke more empathy towards them, reminding us that despite their kind of invader and antagonistic status, um, they're also just beings trying to find their way. Um, that's, that's so fascinating. I mean, like I know in the, the previous highlight, you had also mentioned kind of uh, nightingales, uh, being their sounds being like legal, um, mm -hmm. but because people like the sound of their songs, they're kind of let alone. Whereas here you've got an animal who we can't necessarily hear, but who's been called invasive because they're kind of infecting um, trees. And yeah, I like that you're kind of pointing us to some of these ideas of how animals kind of get framed in, in these problematic ways. But right. I have to say that when you were saying that my mind was imploding with, as you were talking about these like mini explosions happening in mm -hmm. trees, the kind of idea that a tree is a soundscape. You know, we spoke in the episode one about these soundscapes. I think that's just that's just fascinating that these beetles are drawn to particular soundscapes potentially, and that they and that they produce these soundscapes. Right? That's in, that's mm -hmm. incredible. And I think one of the things that I love so much about it is it reminds us that there are, you know, when we think of the soundscape, we think about the things that we can hear, and that mm -hmm. you know we. You know, in the same way as a landscape is, is the stuff that we can see. But, you know, we know that in a landscape, there's all kinds of natures that we can't see that are, you know, underground or too small for us to see or whatever. And and it's kind of similar in, in, a, in a soundscape. There are all of these sounds that we're not able to, to hear and all of these kind of sonic worlds almost that are, that are there that um, that we're not able to hear unless we kind of use these sonic methods in order to hear them and but do you so so are bark beetles considered invasive because they damage trees yeah i think they're considered a really big problem in some parts of the u.s um so these recordings particularly were taken in new mexico um but yeah because of these these drought conditions that create these conditions i don't pretend to understand it too much <laughs> but where the beetles can and then they 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 burrow into the tree and kill the tree um okay. so there's kind of, if I have time, there's another sonic layer to this, um, which is that David Dunn, who is the guy who made these recordings originally, is now kind of using those recordings against the Beatles um, oh, yeah. with these kind of sonic warfare. <laughs> I'm making it sound really negative, but obviously the intention is to save the tree, so it's a good thing, I guess. Um, but these devices, the actors, they play the the Beatles' recorded sounds kind of back to them. Um, mm -hmm. But in they have, what is it, kind of randomly generated electronic sounds underneath um, those beetle sounds um, with the intention to confuse the beetles so they are not able to communicate with each other um, and things like that and so that they won't be able to take over the, the trees. Um, yeah, this raises a whole bunch of, I think, interesting questions about ethics and the ethics of using you know, sonic methods, uh, some of which Jonathan and, I, Jonathan and I did speak about in the, the episode. Um, and, and I guess also how we start to frame kind of invasive species and which yeah. species we like, because there is a hierarchy happening here between the tree and the beetle um, and and 
who belongs where. So really right. fascinating um, to kind of think through. Uh, I'm maybe going to throw some other interesting facts in here about Go for it. Beetles. <laughs> they are three sixteenths inches long. That's that's small. That's pretty small. So. <laughs> That's tiny. Um, they are approximately the size of a pinhead. They are oval and pearly white. I'm, I'm busy looking at um, actually some pictures of the tree, of the wood, and I think I've picked up pieces of wood that, I, I mean, I don't know enough about uh, beetles here, but I think I've picked up pieces of wood where certainly a beetle, whether it's whether it's this beetle has done, because it's really these like intricate kind of twists and turns. It almost looks like an artwork in the in the, the bark itself. Um, but maybe that's that's an engraver beetle or, uh, you know, I need to learn more about beetles. I know. I mean, I'm reminding us that we don't know very much about insects. Whoa. It says there are over 2,000 species of bark beetles. Wow. 2,000 species. And this, again, just kind of shows how we sometimes tend to have, I think, a bit of a mammal bias. You, I mean, gosh, if you start to just think about how much variety there must be. But maybe mm -hmm. I... I don't know. I need to talk to a few more ethologists. I don't know. Well, and maybe <laughs> maybe sonic methods, you know, can can help us to kind of make. Well, I don't want to use make the species visible <laughs> through sound. That's so true. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, teaching us a bit more about black beetles. Anytime. <laughs> A huge thank you to Jonathan for being a wonderful guest, to Animals and Philosophy, Politics, Law and Ethics, Apple, for sponsoring this podcast, to the Sonic Arts Studio and SAP Lab for sponsoring the season, to Hannah Hunter for helping out with the animal highlight, to Jeremy John for the logo and Gordon Clark for the bed music. This is The Animal Turn with me, Claudia Hertzenfelder. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D dot com. Ah!